I'm Lee Brown. This is Crazy Shit in Real Estate. And today we're talking all things short-term rental. Get your notepad and pen handy because I wrote down some really good action tips for short-term rentals talking to Alex Jarbo. If his name's familiar, he's shown up on the Bigger Pockets podcast, which is one of the best financial podcasts out there. So get your notepad, dial in, enjoy the conversation, and I'll see you on the other side. Hello, Alex. Hello, hello. How are you? Good, how are you? Fantastic, thank you. Thanks for having me on. Kind of a fun little backdrop. What'd you do? Put some LED in your bookshelf just to make it fun looking? Yeah, make it less boring. I like it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yay for the little random stuff on Amazon. It makes us feel happy. <laughs> Seriously. All the little lights that don't do anything. <laughs> right. But luckily, they only cost like 20 bucks. And so there's that. <laughs> Where are you based out of? I am in Concord, North Carolina, just outside of Charlotte. How about you? I'm in Asheville, North Carolina. What? I'm going to Cherokee this week for the North Carolina Realtors Convention. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, that's close. We neighbors. So are you in Asheville proper? Or are you in like Flat Rock, Hendersonville? I'm in uh, Arden. Oh, very nice. Yeah, my wife and I just moved to Arden, but most most of my properties are in the county. Actually, none of them are in Asheville proper. So would you like to be involved in our efforts to protect short-term rentals in Buncombe County? I, I don't, I didn't even know that was a thing. Yeah. Dude, they're crazy up there. You've got some crazy elected officials that don't like investors very much. We would like them to like That's them more because they're very some, important to the market. Some, some corrupt individuals as well because I'm on the development side. Yeah. And we won't name any names, but y'all need kind of an overhaul, I think. Yeah, it's intense. Um, I didn't realize how bad it was. Like COVID, COVID really brought out a lot of things, right? Yeah, totally. Like, wow. yeah. And yeah, yeah, things we should have been paying attention to all along. So that's another reason to be grateful for the COVID because it did expose people who making decisions only for themselves. Yeah, or if they've been paid by other people. Yeah. Without disclosure. <laughs> So anyway, tell my audience a little bit about Alex. What are you developing up there in the amazing area of Buncombe County and what all, how'd you get in and around real estate and give us some storyline. I didn't even know we started recording. Yeah, no. Uh, uh, so I like, I like conversational style. So I never tell anybody it just starts. And that's why I'm well, let's hope, let's hope none, of, none of the, none of the County people watch this then. Uh, but uh, no, I don't think don't. they do, but if they do, then they can't even admit it. Cause then they're admitting that they're upset, which means they're the corrupt ones. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, I started, uh, I started in the military for the uh, right out of high school and, um, served four and a half years in the Marine Corps infantry. I was an infantryman by trade. I was stationed in Washington, DC, uh, towards the end of my enlistment. Uh oh, I'll get the good duck out for you. You get the uncle <laughs> Sam duck. I love it. Service. Yeah. I uh, appreciate I'll it. Say, I'll, I'll go. Woo! Woo! <laughs> That's my death dog for you. <laughs> yeah. I haven't done that in six years, probably, but, um, <laughs> you should, your wife would love it. I can just tell. <laughs> oh my, I could definitely, yeah, hundred percent, but no, um, sort of the, I, I came up on about a year left of my enlistment and just, um, I had decided that I didn't want to reenlist. So I just started reading up on a lot of different asset classes, stock market, real estate, real estate really caught my eye just cause I enjoyed the control over it. Um, so I had originally joined a flipping mentorship and then I realized that the gentleman we were on like a group coaching call one day and I realized the gentleman that owned the flipping mentorship, the main mentor, um, all of his long-term wealth was tied into short-term rentals. And this was back seven, eight years ago, even, Ooh, and early. yeah, even early. Yeah. Yeah. So I got on a one-on-one -on -one call with him and, um, he was actually very open with like what he was making cash flow and everything. And, I, I was just comparing that to some of the flipping stuff, some of the the, the long term rental stuff. I was like, okay, like I, I'm I'm very very interested in this. Uh, the hospitality is in my blood. Like my come from a very uh, a family that loves hosting people and everything. So that that it was a nice little segue. So um, he had actually helped me decide on a market, like how to choose a market, and I had, um, I chose Asheville, North Carolina, based off of everything that I was learning from him. So the day I got out of the military, moved here, got my broker's license um, while I was still going to school. And I realized really quickly that everything at that time was either way out of my price range 
or it was in my price range and it just wouldn't have done well as a short-term rental, maybe as a long-term rental, but not a short-term rental. Um, so about like six to eight months of looking, putting offers on properties that weren't working out, I decided to build my very first real estate investment. So it was a, a ground up development. Yeah. Uh, a ground up development, uh, short-term rental, 800 square foot A-frame that we own to this day. Um, one turned into two, two turned into four, brought on some investor capital. And uh, today we're developing $10 million worth. And then we're looking to triple that next year. Okay, so with the cost of building, how was it more effective to build than to buy? That's that's not often what we hear in the investor side. Yeah, so I mean, my my our whole my whole I guess if you want to say thesis is is developing unique cabins or unique properties. So like you're looking at like unique log cabins, a frames. We're playing around with tree houses, cottages, and then you optimize the floor plan. And I love using the first one as an example. Um, because we've owned it for for the longest, so it's been operating for the longest. But um, that first one last year grossed 800 square foot cabin. It, it cost about two hundred fifty thousand to build turnkey with the land and furnishing and everything. Two hundred fifty grand, um, w- which sounds a little expensive for eight hundred square foot, but it grossed eighty two thousand last year, and it netted after debt service forty six thousand. Wow. And I, I'd originally only put about 35 grand of my 30, 35, 40 grand of my own money into it like five, six years ago. So like my ROI, if I, like without investors or anything, it's just my wife and I that own that one. Um, our ROI on that one is a hundred percent, over a hundred percent every single year. Granted that's prior to COVID. So if you want to discount that by 20 or 30%, that's still a 70% ROI. Asterix, yeah. we can't guarantee that anybody would ever be able to match that return. So before blah, everybody blah, blah, messages yeah. <laughs> Alex and says, make that happen for me, cool your jets. But yeah, yeah. just point out that if you're thoughtful about it, you can make really interesting things. Yeah, and, so and just, that's, you know, that's <laughs> to this day, we're still developing, even with higher interest rates. Yeah. The the trades and the, the, the costs are starting to come down with the supplies, but they're never going to be back to where they were prior to COVID. But with that being said, it's like one of the few asset classes right now that you can find, like investors are coming to us, just they're looking for capital preservation right now is what I'm saying. So like, I mean, it's, this is one of the few asset classes that you can actually get some sort of return in this market right now. And so just to, to remind everybody, we're recording this in the middle of October, 2022. And so when we talk about capital preservation, obviously right now, the stock market is literally the most volatile it's ever been. Bonds are at the lowest place we've seen since 1931. And so money does always seek a safe harbor. That's just the nature of the beast. But I want to go back to my original question because it's it's truly one of the biggest hiccups we see in the short-term rental space is the overreach of local governments. And where you're located in Western North Carolina, Buncombe County and Asheville, Asheville more so than Buncombe County, are very right. restrictive on short-term rentals, which is so um, un- insane because the top industry in the area is tourism. And they and have hospitality, back, yep. Right, and they've yep. cut back on the number of hotel rooms available. You need the short-term rentals to make sure there's a place for guests to stay but man, they put all these rules on top of it and you have to be in the zones. So how do you factor that in when you're out hunting for a property, if you're, especially if you're from out of the area? So how does somebody navigate that? Because a tourism and hospitality market is obviously a wonderful opportunity yeah. for providing a place for people to stay. And it, it's just, it's hard to get that message across with people who have this bias thinking everything's a, a frat house party every night when I'm an Airbnb guest. I'm a super quiet guest who cooks in the kitchen. So how yeah. do you the narrative to get fixed? Absolutely. So I, I've stood in for, so when I first started I, out of necessity, I went into the county because I couldn't afford anything in the city. Um, and that helped us during COVID because people pushed out of the metro Detroit. Uh, I said Detroit. I'm originally from Detroit. Um, but they have they pushed out for Detroit too, to be fair. So you're actually. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's funny. But uh, yeah, they pushed out of the metro markets into more rural settings anyway. So that helped us during COVID. But um, I mean, we're still investing that way. And yeah, I mean, uh, luckily, our planning department's actually really good with with answering those questions. And I'm never uh, I'm never against telling people to avoid their planning department like they're there for a reason. 
go and ask them how your property can be developed or the property that you're considering considering can be developed. Um, I also don't shy away from like in this county, you need a short term rental complex permit for anything that's more than two units that are adjacent to each other. But if you do everything right and to the right zoning, almost every every single zoning district outside of an HOA allows for short term rentals in the county currently. Like if you have less than three, so two next to each other. If you go over that, you need this complex permit. And what I learned is you essentially just have to translate and communicate with the county because I've stood in front of the board and I've gotten these permits that you are managing the property stricter than if someone's going to be living there long term. Oh, okay. And that that is one thing that's helped me. So one of the one of the tools that we use is a tool called Noise Aware. And it's a little, it's a little, we like to put it on the back of the TVs. Um, it monitors, it doesn't record anything. It just monitors decibel levels in the property. And then, um, so like after a certain time, whether it be 10, 11, 12 PM, um, you can, you could essentially set it where if it hits a certain decibel level where being, people are being too loud, you don't even got to put them inside. They have ones that can go just outside if people are screaming at 10 PM. Um, the guests will automatically get a text message telling them that they're being too loud. If you want to set it like that, I put that exact thing in my permit and I talked about that. So, and then another thing is I always like to tell them like short-term rentals, you have a cleaning company going through there at least once a week, if not one, two, three times a week, depending on what your minimum stay restrictions are. Um, That property is getting taken care of better if someone's living there long-term, like in terms of cleaning. So that's another thing. Uh, another thing we do is uh, a tool called StayFi, which is a little a disc that plugs into the back of the router and it creates a landing page for your internet. So the guest has to put their email address, every guest has to put their email address in um, to get access to the internet. You can set a thir- you can set a certain threshold on that, that it's like, say if a property sleeps six people, you could say like, if, if there's more than 15 devices attached to the internet, I want to get a text message. So that's another thing. So if you get like 30 people attached to the internet and it only, or 30 devices attached to the internet, but only sleep six people, more than likely something's happening there. Um, and then Airbnb VRBO have nothing against placing a camera that, that faces the driveway. So that's it. So between noise aware, stay fi and that camera, that, that, that will, that that's what I tell the counties is that, um, and then the the cleaning thing. But yeah, the the going back to your original question, you want to communicate to them that you're managing the property stricter than if someone's living there long term, and that also protects you from if neighbors decide to join these meetings because it happens all the time. Uh, on top of the county being strict, like you're going to have neighbors that just don't want that in their backyard nimbies, right? So if you're communicating to them that this is all happening, the 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 neighbor's opinion doesn't matter. Like it does matter, but it's like, if you're doing everything right, if it's to the right zoning, if you're even, the fact that you're even standing in front of the board and trying to get this permit shows that you actually care about doing things right. Um, so uh, when when the argument about, oh, what are the neighbors going to say about it? If you're doing everything to the book, it doesn't matter what they say. So, and obviously that, that, that comes with, you still want to be nice to your neighbors. You want to be a neighbor that all my neighbors have their, my contact info, but I listen to their, I listen to their, um, I'm not going to say complaints, but like, I I listen to their worries to a point, right? Because at a certain point, it's like, okay, I'm, I'm confident that I'm doing the right thing. I'm not destroy. I don't feel like I'm destroying the community by putting these in. So it's like, you, you, you take those opinions with a grain of salt as well. But I love that, especially thinking about that angle of the cleaners coming in multiple times, you could buy that same property and make it a long-term rental but nobody's going to clean that property. Somebody's there taking care of it. And right. how much of the relationship is what solves everything. The fact that you know who your neighbors are solves for so many of the problems that we Absolutely. see out there. And I tell my investors that one of the first things you do is take your information and give it to each one of the surrounding neighbors. Because Absolutely. Also they'll know about a problem long before you'll know or a property manager or the sheriff. In fact, one of my properties, the Next door neighbor was the one that told me I had tenants that had abandoned ship in the middle of the night and left it a hot mess so I could get right over there and deal with it. Whereas if I'd waited until the cleaning crew came or somebody else, it could have been several days. And then you just never know anymore. So it's it's all relationships. But I love that angle of the cleaners. That's a smart, smart tip. 
And that, 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 that comes from, uh, I, um, I'm a, a coach for one of the biggest rental arbitrage communities in the country, uh, BNB formula. And that's one of the things we tell our students when they're looking to get like, um, uh, like hosts to, or the owners to lease to them essentially is, is the same thing. It's like, there's a cleaner coming in one to three times a week. Like they're going to be telling me what's wrong with the property. If something's wrong with the property, a long-term tenant's not going to be doing that. No, long-term tenant doesn't want you in the house at all. At all. Yeah. <laughs> it's the their family. house now. Yeah, yeah. They call it the state. They call it the right to quiet enjoyment. And I don't think that applies yeah. to short-term rentals, although we, if we use noise aware, we can have quiet enjoyment. I love that tool. Yeah, yeah. Right, so talk to me a little bit about what you're doing right now. What are you looking for in a rising interest rate environment where we still mm. have a shortage of supply and people have to have somewhere to go? So I'd love to know what your viewpoint is in the changing market. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so sticking to the same thing about developing these unique properties, um, we're also purchasing properties. We're purchasing properties that have some sort of acreage attached to them. So there has to be a unique aspect to them, whether it be a log cabin or if it's already a, a short-term rental community. Um, we're, I'm purchasing properties that have some sort of acreage attached where I can do future development on. Um, with higher interest rates, do like I mean, prices are dropping. I mean, I'm, I, I'm seeing it every single morning, like the getting the notifications that the price drop here, 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 here. So that's good um, in terms of it, it's not perfectly balanced. It's not like interest rates doubled in the right. last six months. It, it's like prices didn't drop in correlation to that. Uh, but I, I've been I'm a I'm a writer for Bigger Pockets for the short term rental content, and one of the first articles that I wrote for them was saying that do not discount any type of real estate investing just because of what's happening in the markets right now. You might get a good deal across your table, like underwrite it, underwrite it and go or ha have your agent or whoever underwrite it for you. And it, it might be a good deal even at the higher interest rates. And if you can make it, and this is what I've been telling my investors, if you, we can make it work in this lending environment, imagine what's going to happen when we refinance out of that interest rate. It's going to be even better. So that that that's that's been my whole strategy with that is we're we're purchasing we're purchasing properties. Uh, what I like to do now and even on the development side is the best use of my time is developing six to twelve cabins at a time at like a cluster development where it's like we're building cabin communities. We I choose some sort of theme whether it be a frames, tree houses, barn dominiums, something like that, and then we we tie a theme to it like that, and then we we, do, we find like anywhere between ten to twenty acres, and we develop those properties on that. So that's the that's the best use of my time. And then when it comes to investors, I'm bringing on um, just different uh, like fund like syndicators where I'm the operator and the deal finder, and then the, they find the cash and the capital. Yeah. So let me ask you a question: When you're talking about buying acreage and developing it into a small community, how do you handle the requirements for curb and gutter and streets and mailboxes, or is this going to be exempt because they're rental properties? Yeah, um, from what I have seen with dealing with my county, that was exempt because um, that was one thing with the mailboxes. I don't think any of my properties have mailboxes now that I'm thinking about it. Yeah, that's a good question. I've never gotten that question curious, before. Because like yeah, in yeah. the county where I live, once you start doing anything with more than four properties, they're calling you a minor subdivision. And then you're right. dealing with curb and gutter and DOD. You know how you, you, know, you, you, know how you get around that? You do primary and accessory dwelling units. See, our county doesn't allow access. Oh, okay. So, they, yeah, yeah. Buncombe still hasn't cut on yet. Hopefully no one's listening. Yeah. Does. I will say one of my personal goals as a realtor who's involved in the advocacy side of the business, I'd like to see statewide acceptance of the accessory dwelling units. I don't give California much credit, but they got that right when they said For sure. we can allow yeah. ADUs. I mean, where I, where, where I learned the ADU strategy was from someone who lived in California. So, yeah, 100%. Yeah, so for you normal people out there, what we're talking about with an accessory dwelling unit, we most affectionately call that the granny flat. So you've got your house and you build a little house for mom in the backyard where you can have her close by and keep an eye on her. It's the same parcel, but a secondary living space. And so that's what we're referencing. And it's one of the most elegant solutions to the housing shortage, but also to the fact that some people want to be close to the area where they came from where they've lived for 30 years, but they don't need 3,000 square feet anymore, but they don't want to be separated from the church and the grocery and the neighbors. And there's all kinds of societal improvements that can happen with this. It's just, it's a thought process. But then you also look at 
somebody who, as we head into a more challenged economy, because I think finally, even the government acknowledges we're now in a recession. So kudos to them for finally admitting it out loud. Yeah, just just one we, quarter late. Yeah. <laughs> is it that late? I mean, <laughs> Two quarters. They're just, they, they need some economics background, but that's a different discussion. So when you look at that, when it's harder for somebody to make their obligations financially, if they could put a, another unit on that parcel or turn the basement into a secondary unit, right. people can stay put. And there's a, a real improvement to the quality of life with that. And we saw that during the last recession. If a lot of people had been able to figure out the finance, they could have stayed put and they wouldn't have been ruined. But there was there was no alternate path. And we didn't really have short term rentals as something in 2008 because the share economy was a, in its infancy. So I think it's many, many layers of how these can be really beneficial to the marketplace. And I mean, let's talk about, talk about things like short term rentals acting as midterm rentals. Are you seeing that trend start to grow with like travel nurses and people who need a three to yeah. six month environment? What's interesting about mid, yes. And so what's interesting about midterm rentals is um, where, not, not where I learned about it, but that where I learned about this way of thinking with midterm rentals is a lot of times when you look at short-term rental regulations in a city, it's 30 days and under. So a, a lot of times the midterm rental stuff can skirt the short-term rental laws in the city if you do 30 days plus to say about six months or whatever the number is. I forgot what it is in North Carolina. Um, but that going back to, uh, we were talking about regulations, when, when we're developing these properties, um, prior to COVID, I would, I would underwrite them as long-term rentals. Um, that was my backup. And then my second backup was going to be selling the property because I'm, we, we develop anywhere between 400 square foot. If we're looking at the smallest property we do, we've developed so far all the way to only 1600. Uh, we have a 3000 square foot cabin that we own, but we purchased that one. When it comes to, to development, the biggest one I've developed is only 1600 square foot. Um, I like to stick within that range. And I consider that more like the affordable housing range where it's like, there's always going to be a need for that. So for people who are scared of getting into short-term rentals because of short-term rental regulations, you can go, you can downgrade or not downgrade. That's the wrong word. It you can go in. You, yeah. You can repurpose into a midterm rental. And then if the long-term rental thing, the numbers work, you can do that. It's a little bit more difficult after COVID with the higher prices of everything, trades and uh, uh, labor and uh, materials and everything. But if, if you can, if you're scared to get into either development or purchasing of short-term rentals, you can always turn it into a midterm rental. And if that doesn't work, you can always sell it because there's always going to be a need for some sort of affordable housing, which is what I consider that square footage range to be. And that's also very market insulated because no matter what happens in the overall no market, the cheaper, less expensive workforce housing, lower price point always has buyers and sellers because people have to have somewhere to live. Now, because you're an expert, I would love to know right. how you advise people on the management of short-term rentals, especially if they are in a full-time job and they're yeah. thinking to themselves, I can't run over there and change the sheets and let them in the house. How do I manage this? Because with more turn, there's obviously more labor involved. So what is your response to that? And how do you feel yeah. about these super hosts that are out there now? Have you ever driven by a house that you sold and somebody else's sign is in the yard? It's about the most painful experience any realtor will ever have. And then comes that moment of, oh snap, it's on me. I didn't stay in great touch. And I can tell you after 22 years in the business, I still go through that, but I've reduced the opportunities for failure because I have learned to do better with follow-up. And honestly, when you follow up better with the people you've served in the past, it's gonna make you a better realtor in the future too. And that's what this program will get you. If you've never heard of follow-up boss, you're gonna love it. The best top producers in this business, they're already using follow-up boss. So if you wondered why that person gets more business than you, it might be the program. There's like 250 integrations. So whatever you're using now probably could plug in with follow-up boss, keep everything in one place. You can decide how many and how often to follow up. It's all on you, but the system will be there. If you do get a 30-day free trial for hanging out over here on crazy shit, go to followupboss.com slash crazy. Yeah, so uh, we sell we are my second development second business we self manage in house. That's some of the value we bring to our investors. Um, if you're looking to do it yourself, 
outside of hiring a, a, um, a management company. Um, yeah, there's there's four there's four pillars to that that I always like to talk about. So the first one's going to be auto, automating your messaging. So um, there's a really cool tool I like to use called Hospitable that will allow you to automate about sixty to seventy percent of your messaging. Um, so all my pre checkout my or my confirmation message, my pre check in message, my check in message, my check up message, my pre checkout message, and then my post check up on the guest message is all sent out via automated messaging um, that integrates both with Airbnb and VRBO both, and it just automatically sends out. What's really cool about that tool is it will also automate your reviews, which doesn't sound like a lot, but I would say if you get over three properties, it starts to get annoying about just sending the same review to people. Yeah. Um, so what the, as long as they do a good job, which 95% of the time, you don't have to review a guest bad or whatever, um, you can pre like do five pre-made five-star reviews and put them into that system. And the system will literally just pull one and just review the guest for you. Um, nice. So yeah, so that that's number one is automated messaging. Uh, number two, which I think is probably the most important thing is your cleaning company. So you want to be hiring a cleaning company that has experience in short-term rentals, right. not long-term, not long-term rentals, not, not, not for houses that people live in, like if they're just taking care because they need to be on a strict uh, on a strict schedule, it has to happen between this time on this day, blah blah blah. So my cleaning com I don't have a COO, I don't have a boots on the ground manager. We already talked about this, so it's like my cleaning company is going in there one in, one to three times a week, and they are seeing if something is wrong with the property. They're handling my linens, they're handling my inventory, and then just charging me directly. Um, they're also handling my lost and found. And again, the, we, we have something worked out where where I pay them extra for handling that. Same thing with the inventory. And then um, everything is just charged to me directly. All of our calendars are synced, and then um, it's it's paid off at the end of the month. Um, so that that's your boots on the ground manager when it comes to if anything is wrong, they're they're sending you pictures, they're calling you, or they're going to call your manager, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, but yeah, that's that's probably the biggest piece to your puzzle is going to be your cleaning company um, because the, and a lot of times the cleaning companies will have a management portion, like management thing to their business as well. Um, the third thing is going to be um, a maintenance person. I forgot where I'd found mine. I think I found mine on Craigslist, but he had some experience. I like to do when you're first starting, obviously don't bring someone on full time or even part time. I like to put someone on retainer like four to five hundred dollars a month. And then I pay them hourly for any work they need to get done. Nice. Um, that's helped us. There aren't too many maintenance issues with new construction properties. So that that's that's why I've been able to get away with that so far. So that's the third piece. Um, the fourth, so there's probably actually five, the fourth piece is going to be, and this is brand new is virtual, a virtual assistant. So we, so virtual assistants, we use, uh, I started using virtual assistants, uh, like maybe three, four months ago. And that virtual assistant is, uh, sourced from the Philippines and we source them from their ex Airbnb or Marriott employees. So they already understand the platforms. So, they're, okay. they're already in hospitality. So, so anything that with that background. Uh, on Upwork, because Upwork, it, so here's a, here's a fun little I thing. Didn't see Upwork listed like that they had worked there. This is I use Upwork all the time. So what you can do, it's not necessarily that the, the you you post the job, but if you go on Upwork's website right now, Airbnb's logo is at the bottom. They source their VAs from Upwork. Yeah, oh. or at least part of them, or uh, like a, so when you when you go there and you're saying like, okay, I'll pay to, like. Uh, a virtual assistant can take anywhere between 12 to 15 properties at the same time with just the messaging piece. Um, Cause again, most of your messaging is automated. They're just handling all the little questions that come up. Um, you're paying them anywhere between 12 to $1,500 a month to take care of that. And that's, that's a very premium pay for, for where they live. So that, and that's almost double of what like Airbnb and Marriott would be paying them anyways. Okay. Yeah. So that's what, um, so virtual assistants, number four, and then the fifth one, I think we already talked about, which was the noise aware. So I'm going to put a, the fifth one's going to be remote lock. So remote lock is going to be a tool that it's, it's um, I mean, I have e-locks in all my properties, but uh, remote lock as a service, you can also purchase the locks from them, uh, all the, all, all the brand locks from them. Um, it will, remote lock will sync with the lock and then it will change the code to the lock with every guest. And it, you can set it to where, um, I don't remember if it was remote lock that actually does this. I think it does. It, you can change the low. It's just a random digit for us. And we haven't said it yet, but you can change it to the last four digits of their phone number as well. 
um, for, for, uh, cause that's just easy. Cause I, I, I recently checked into a boutique hotel and they're like, the code to the door is the last four digits of your phone number. I was like, that's awesome. So, um, I would love that as a guest. Yeah. 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 And it's simple. We always have a backup key just in case that like one in a hundred that doesn't work for some reason, maybe the guests can't even figure it out. So there is like a, a lock box on the property where people can get, get into. Um, but yeah, that's, that's sort of the five, six pieces you need to practically remotely manage your property from a distance. And a, another step above that, it's not necessarily a tool. It's just like, you just tell your virtual assistant to talk to your cleaning company and maintenance person. You just tell your maintenance person and cleaning crew to talk to your virtual assistant. And you're, you're, you're only handling emergencies, like major, major emergencies. So. Okay. So I, I'm kind of sad right now because are you saying Uh-oh. that every time I've been in an Airbnb and I'm messaging with the host, it's really a VA. It's not the host. Oh no, not every time. I mean, I still see my messages oh, that come one, through. Yeah, yeah. Like I was talking to real people. Oh, there are real people. <laughs> there are real people, but I feel like I had a relationship with the property owner. And hey, maybe, hey, maybe, maybe, I maybe mean, they were really my friends. Maybe, maybe yeah. they were. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. This is so fast. As long as, as long as the guest is having a phenomenal experience, I mean, that's that's. I know, but part yeah. of my phenomenal experience is feeling like I know this little entrepreneur who owns this cottage in Maine, and now I find out they hired somebody. Oh. That means they're doing well. <laughs> that means that means they got so busy that they couldn't handle it that they had to hire someone. I know. Well, the, the place that we rent from in Maine, I mean, they've got several cottages, but they just live call, right there. Just call them out. It's like, is this a first, is is this actually Ashley or whoever? Like, <laughs> they'll probably lie to me now, Alex. Now I know too much. Now I know too much. Damn you! That's funny. <laughs> All right. So before I let you off of here, you've given us so many great tools and insights. What's the best way for somebody to follow you, learn from you, read your contributions to bigger pockets? How do they find Alex? Yeah. Um, I have a free YouTube channel that we just, we, I, I, I'm, I'm on site almost every single day in the morning, just checking up all my properties. So I'm like, I'm just going to bring a camera with me. So, um, I started doing YouTube videos, just posting on, uh, on YouTube, just like all the, the day-to-day stuff. And also how to like stuff we talked about today, how to manage properties and stuff. So that's going to be on Alex Builds. Um, it's a little, it's a logo of a little blue treehouse. Um, you guys can check me out on Bigger Pockets. I'm pretty active in the comment section there. Same thing with YouTube. And then my personal site is alexdrabo.com. We got like a small coaching program in there if you guys are interested in that. My YouTube channel also lives in there, past interviews, and then also some of our past projects that we've funded with investors are in there as well. Oh, very cool. Well, yeah, thank yeah. you so much for coming on the show and giving us a ton of really good little tidbits to go check out for everybody in short-term rentals. And for those of y'all that are looking for a place to go put your money in safe Harbor, just remember that people always have to have somewhere to live and somewhere to stay. And that's why real estate is fairly attractive, no matter what the markets are doing. So Alex, thank you for coming on and sharing your insights. And I look forward to seeing you in person sometime. Oh, thanks for having me. I had fun, fun. (laughs) All right, guys, say something nice about Alex in the comments, subscribe, and we'll see you next time. So if you found value in this episode, please like and subscribe to this channel, turn on the bell and catch another amazing episode by clicking above. Crazy Shit in Real Estate is also available on all of your normal podcast apps. So if that's where you like to hang out, go find me, click subscribe. And most importantly, leave me a review that says you think I'm awesome, my guests are awesome, or this content is just exactly what you were looking for. And then by the way, if there's something you need, you want to learn about something, you can comment below anytime. You can also send me a direct message if you need to remain anonymous. No judgment. But anyway, I'll only judge if you forget to subscribe and click. I'll see you next time.